I, we waited the requisite three or four or five minutes to, to begin this morning's conference. Uh, this is uh, my first time hosting a, a guest from outside in the Cancer Center. It's uh, my pleasure to have Dr. Vernon Steele here. He's been a uh, He's, he's, he's been an awesome person to be interacting with for basically a generation uh, the whole time I've been here with Dr. Wattenberg uh, because of the way that he he's always done things the whole time I've known him. Um, Dr. Uh, Steele first started out his career uh, as a biology major at Bucknell University. He did uh, MS and PhD degrees in radiation biology at University of Rochester, but uh, but much later, early in the early 90s, he went off and he did an MPH degree at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, in the 90s at the NCI, uh, when, I, when I was at the NIH for a little while in the mid-90s, I got to meet the sort of people that were in the division of cancer prevention. And they had a really, really interesting way that they did things. And uh, the way that they did things is they had the clinicians who were trying to get the clinical trials off nationally and the RFAs for all the contracts clinically paired up with the basic scientists, the translational scientists who had the portfolio of, of, uh, of interesting drugs, interesting models, interesting organ systems. And, uh, and Dr. Steele was the, was, the, was the gateway in a lot of ways for that whole program for the past 20 years or even greater at the NCI. He's retired now as about a year, but, uh, but I've been massively impressed with the way that he's always translationally thought about cancer. And I'll just, I had a personal family, I had a family member, immediate family member who had cancer about five years ago. And um, I had really good access just because I spent time at the NIH and then a surgical oncologist here uh, to be able to tap into the, uh, the best people I knew I could get good advice about for cancer care. And uh, just about everyone on the list was some sort of a clinician, but I also ended up tapping into Dr. Steele for clinical advice for an immediate family member for, for cancer care. And I think that that's the sort of thing that really speaks, um, speaks volumes to the way that, uh, that cancer chemo prevention has to, has to work and the way that targeted therapies have to work. And I think it's always better when you're able to meld translational and basic scientists with uh, interested clinicians, interested surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, who have this desire to try and get different types of agents into the cancer prevention uh, realm in clinical trials. So with, uh, without any further ado, a uh, good colleague and friend, Vernon Steele. Get my cheering squad over here. Uh, First of all, I want to thank Frank for inviting me here. Uh, this is, I've been here many times, but it's always a pleasure to come back to Minneapolis. And thank uh, Beverly and Marilyn for helping me, uh, guiding me through everything and finding the right people to talk to and uh, finding a place to stay. But uh, I, I think it's also appropriate that I, I come back after retirement to the, like the birthplace of cancer prevention. And Lee Wattenberg started this back probably before I was born. <laughs> Steve will attest to that. Long time ago, we were talking last night about what his first experiments was. I think he was feeding broccoli to animals or something. Or, uh, but uh, it was back in the 40s and 50s he started. So I think it's appropriate I come back. He was my idol. He wanted me to call him Lee, but I could never call him anything but Dr. Wattenberg. <laughs> I said, first name basis, he's like the grandfather. So um, I've been uh, in the cancer agent development research group for 28 years. Uh, and I've seen, I've seen it grow. There were five people when I came. There were 15 when I left. And it's going in new directions. I think it's flourishing. Uh, I made sure they had a good chief when I left. I <laughs> trained them personally. But uh, I was in, in charge of that program the last 10 years. And that's when we started the Prevent Cancer Program, which is a new, a new paradigm to get drug development done because Drug companies are not really interested in developing cancer preventive drugs. There's, there's no immediate payback like there is in therapy. It's, it's just a long road, and it's, it's a tough sell to upper management in drug companies. I've, but we, we partnered with a, a good many drug companies uh, over the years, and I'll touch on some of those today. 
Um, this is an important point. It's usually impossible to know why one person develops cancer and the other one doesn't. But we do know there's a lot of risk factors involved, and I listed a dozen of them on the right there. A lot of you're familiar with age, of course. Uh, cancer wasn't a problem last century because people never lived too long, <laughs> and so it was a relatively rare disease. But we know alcohol, and we're exposed to cancer-causing substances every day. Chronic inflammation is one of the key areas, I think, where we can non-toxically make a dent in the cancer process, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Diet, of course, we are what we eat. Diet, uh, people in America don't eat a very healthy diet, and it's causing a lot of cancer problems. Hormones, endogenous and exogenous hormones. Immunosuppression, there's a, uh, a lot of that that happens. Aging is an immunosuppressive event. Uh, your uh, immune system decreases with age. Infectious agents, there are opportunistic infectious agents all over the place uh, that do cause cancer, like HPV and HIV. Obesity is a huge problem in this country. I was always a little disgruntled. It took NIH a long time until the, I think the early 2000s or late 90s before NIH recognized that obesity and weight were a health problem in this country. I couldn't believe they didn't recognize it. I was out lecturing on this back <laughs> in the early 90s, 10 years before NIH recognized it, and I was showing all kinds of graphs and figures to say uh, obesity causes many different kinds of cancer, almost every, because uh, people are overweight and these little fat cells generate all kinds of hormones that aren't good for you, and all kinds of inflammatory substances that aren't good for you, so you have your own chronic inflammation from being overweight. Radiation uh, has always been around. I started out in radiation biology, <laughs> so I know uh, that that's been around. Uh, it's not quite, you know, we're, of course, we're exposed to background, but people get a lot of diagnostic tests these days. Sunlight, of course, which is the cause of the, the main cancer we have in our human population, skin cancer. I'm not immune to that. <laughs> uh, I got sunburned many times when I was small. We didn't know about sunscreen back when I was little. I got, I got toasted every time I went to the beach. And so I, I, I end up going to, you have to go to the, my dermatologist twice a year now. <laughs> but, and tobacco, of course. Uh, a lot of people work in tobacco here, and that's probably one of the main problems we have, especially with the lung cancer and urine, bladder cancer. And it's, it's the list of cancers caused by tobacco use goes on and on. Every time I look, it's a longer list. Uh, I want to say a little bit about uh, Elizabeth Blackburn. She was one of our supporters. She was past president of AACR, Nobel laureate. And this is what she said in one of our, her papers. Uh, I guess about seven years now, we as cancer research have a great opportunity. The excitement of the current opportunities in uh, the development of science of cancer prevention has never been better, never been greater. There's a lot of opportunity. Uh, it's a growing field. It's not a hypothesis anymore. We have proven we can prevent cancer in humans with double-blind double trials for a number of agents now. So it's, back when I started, it was kind of, a, you know, I hope we can do this. But then <laughs> uh, we were able to do this and, uh, for, for a number of organs, organ systems now. And if you don't believe her, here's uh, another friend, Bert Vogelstein, a uh, friend of mine from Hopkins. Uh, He's, he's worried about the number of cancers uh, that are coming up uh, probably by the mid-century. Uh, we've got to get serious about preventing cancer now. There's, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for it. And I put down the new 217 facts from uh, ACS, uh, uh, 1.7 million almost new cancers every day for this year. And about 600,000 people are going to die this year from cancer. So we have to get more active in this field. Here's the uh, opportunity. Let's see if my pointer works here. As you go from normal, usually epithelial, most cancers are epithelial in nature, uh, and you progress from initiated cells into mild dysplasia, moderate dysplasia, severe dysplasia, finally carcinoma in situ, and invasive cancer on the right. Yeah, my right. Uh, so for a number of organ systems, cervix, breast, colon, prostate, lung, there is a long latency period be time between when the first changes start occurring in this epithelium 
until you get invasive cancer. It's a long latency some decades, uh, as you can see. Uh, head and neck cancer is decades before you start seeing dysplasia. Uh, and then another uh, almost decade before you see cancer. So there's a lot of time to intervene in, in cancers. It's uh, opportunities. And so over the years, we've done a lot of research trying to figure out well, what are what are the early signs that we can see? And uh, I hadn't. This is lung cancer, but uh, you can do this for a lot of different cancers. Now, uh, you can see microsatellite alterations, loss of heterozygosity very early, around hyperplasia, P16 alterations, RB telomerase dysregulation, make overexpression occurs early. Some of these continue on into invasive cancer as you get to dysplasias. 8P21, loss of heterozygosity, you start beginning to see angiogenesis fit. You, you lose that in lung cancer. Uh, P53 loss, P53 mutations, that plays a major role. Aneuploidy seems to be a constant in almost all cancers, one of the, one of the constants. Rare to find a diploid cancer. And methylation changes occurs probably the whole time. Uh, that's just a new field, though. In EGFR1 mutations, that happens relatively late in KRAS, relatively late in the process. So there's a lot of upper. We know a lot about uh, some targets, early targets. I think we need to find more and better early targets. And uh, later in my speech, I think you're going to have to target a couple of these at once. Uh, if you target one, it ain't going to work. This is the famous field cancerization slide I've been using for 30 years. We call it the mattress slide. Uh, <laughs> And it represents almost any epithelium. And you have to realize that any epithelium, lung, uh, skin, uh, bladder epithelium, you've got lots of different clones at different stages of the cancer process. Some over here, they're already invading the basement membrane. Some over here very early, have very early changes. But the one that's going to kill you is the one that is the furthest along, usually. And so if you cut this one out, you got more that are coming. So it's, it's a, a major philosophical problem in terms of preventing cancer. You have to do something that affects all these areas, slows all these areas down. Uh, let's see. So what I'm going to do, uh, talk about four different areas. I'm going to talk about some targeted chemoprevention agents. Uh, I'll talk about a new field that uh, we've been working on for the last five or six years, chemoprevention vaccines. I have a bias for chemoprevention vaccines. I think that's the way to go, but I, I'll let you decide. Uh, and then in chemoprevention, you're going to give a drug for a long period of time, sometimes the entire rest of the life of somebody. So we have to develop ways to reduce toxicity because every, every chemical agent is toxic, even aspirin. Uh, so you have to figure out What's the best strategy to reduce toxicity? And uh, before I left, uh, we were looking at uh, how long do you have to give an agent? You may not have to give it the rest of your life. You may have to give it like five years, like tamoxifen. You give it five years, you can uh, maybe not take it for a while. You don't have to give them forever. And there's very little work done in that area. Some people assume, well, the animal studies are short, so you assume <laughs> that you're going to give it forever. But you, I don't think you really have to. And uh, I'll talk about different ways to reduce toxicity. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the future strategies uh, we should consider to keep this field moving forward. This is a snapshot of the PREVENT program, my advertising slide. One of them. Anyway, and this is what, how, where we are right now. We have 43 small molecules, targeted agents uh, in preclinical work, uh, cell culture, animal work, uh, 18 vaccines under development. Uh, mostly in animal, most, mostly in preclinical work. Uh, secondary testing, that's looking at combinations of agents, uh, looking at how long you have to give them, and uh, other ways of reducing toxicity, different routes, different routes of exposure. And then ones that are crossing into the clinic, we have to give animal toxicology work in order to get a drug through the FDA to get their permission to give it to people. Without that, you can't give it to people unless it's a... Uh, recognized food, a grass substance called generally recognized as safe. Uh, so this is where we are right today. I just pulled this off the internet last week, so it's pretty up to date. So this is the PREVENT program. Uh, there's, if people want to get 
have an agent they want to be develop. NCO will use its resources and they consider it's a good idea to help you develop that agent through to the uh, IND. That's, that's where our program ends. Once they get the IND and you give it to clinicians, hand it off to them, and then they, they go forward with it. Um, so let's say a little bit about chemical agonists and antagonists. This is one the first approach I'll talk about. Uh, this is a series of mechanisms that uh, have been around and we keep expanding on these. I, as I said before, the anti-inflammatories, I believe, is a key uh, mechanism that we need to inhibit. We worked on COX-1-2 inhibitors, mixed inhibitors, COX-2 solid, like solely inhibitors like celecoxib, just five lipoxygenase inhibitors like xylutin, we've done a lot of work with. There are combination COX-LOX inhibitors like glycophalone that looks very promising in animal models, uh, prostacyclines, and glucocorticoids, which you have some experience here at the University of Minnesota. These are anti-inflammatories which show a lot of promise in the animals, and some actually have shown a lot of promise in the clinic, like the top three here. Clinical results, Celecox has been in the clinic. Xylutin, I think, had a trial. Uh, Glycophalone is uh, working on a source for that. But antioxidants, these, peop these uh, are uh, mostly natural products or derived from natural products, and these are key in terms of preventing DNA damage uh, in your everyday life. I think there's a lot of uh, good there. Uh, resveratrol has been around, sulforaphane, diendolmethane. That's a dimer of indole-3-carbonyl, which is a very promising agent. Of course, green tea studies, there's a lot of green tea studies going on. Uh, the anti-hormones have been successful in the clinic, especially the SERMs, uh, selective estrogen response modifiers, raloxifen, tamoxifen, benzodoxifene, and aromatase inhibitors, exomestane, letrozole, and anostrozole. I think these, these are proven chemopreventive agents in the clinic. A lot of women take these, and I think uh, they need probably consider doing uh, combinations of these agents for breast cancer. And the men have the uh, androgen receptor blockers, the uh, biclutamide, flutamide, and the 5-alpha steroid reductors like finasteride. And there was a trial that showed a little bit of evidence for finasteride uh, being active at preventing prostate cancer. It wasn't real strong, but it was some evidence. I think these, these uh, androgen receptor blockers and 5-alpha, there's a lot of work that needs done in that, especially for half the population of aging men. Come on up. And so I, I encourage people to, to work on that. And there's a lot of cell metabolism modulators. I just listed two. There's a whole list of them. I didn't want to go on to another slide. But DFMO, dimethylfluoroornithine, uh, is a uh, ODC inhibitor. It inhibits polyamine synthesis. And the combination of DFMO and Solendac prevented half human polyps uh, and almost 90% of the serious human polyps in a clinical trial. It was done out in uh, Arizona and, and Frank Maskins and uh, Dave Alberts. Uh, PPAR agonists like pioglozone. We have some experience here with this drug, uh, a good mechanism. Uh, so this is a taste uh, of the menu of things that are on for mechanism-based drug development. Uh, here's a look at some of the newer examples, newer class studies we've done. HDAC inhibitors, these look promising, at least in the uh, animals. I'll talk a little bit about Saha, uh, Vernistat. Uh, modulating the mTOR pathway, this looks promising. Rapamycin, I'll show you some slides on rapamycin. There's a number of drugs we've considered. PI3 kinase inhibitors. Myo-inositol is one that you have some experience here in. I think that's a, a good drug. AMP kinase inhibitors. Uh, metformin, relatively non-toxic diabetic drug, uh, seems to work in some animal models. There's some, uh, a lot of studies going on in metformin. I don't know what the final outcome is going to be. Uh, AKT kinase inhibitors, uh, like dimendylmethyl, uh, a uh, 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 Stanford Research Institute uh, chemical that will inhibit AMPT, a AKT protein kinase, EGFR. These are in the clinic. Carceva, Eresa, Lapatinib, and a new MEK inhibitor made by AstraZeneca. So these are some new class studies. This is a partial list. Uh, we, we typically went through all the different classes we could think of and, and made up a list of agents for consideration and had big meetings and figure out which one's going to move forward because we 
didn't have enough money to move all of them toward it, obviously. Uh, this is a success we had with metformin. This is a uh, model of pancreatic cancer in transgenic animals, mice, or rats, excuse me. And uh, this pre pre prevented cancer from progressing by targeting uh, stem cells, we think, in mTOR signaling. And I'll show you some data on this. So here's males and females at a low dose and a high dose of metformin. And these doses, these are in the feed, parts per million in the feed. And it's not out of range of what people take when you consider uh, milligrams per kilogram. And so in the uh, males, uh, they usually get about 80% cancer in, in uh, regular transgenic animals, pancreatic cancer. And so we were able to knock that down to 20 or 30% with the two, two different doses. It doesn't seem to be much difference here. In the females, though, the higher dose knocked out all the pancreatic cancer. They went pancreatic cancer, ductal pancre ductal, uh, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. That's what we're measuring here. They knocked them 60% to zero. So it looks like a good drug. Of course, metformin may have activity in the pancreas since it's a good diabetic drug. It made sense. And, and people have taken it. It has a long history of human exposure. So. Uh, we, we brought this up uh, in a, we had a pancreatic cancer prevention workshop a year or two ago, and we brought this up for people look, looking at uh, how to prevent prostate cancer. And here, if you look at uh, immunohistochemical staining or immunofluorescence, here's mTOR, untreated here, and knock it down at formin, and eliminate here on immunostaining. AMP kinase, again, this was increased with, it, with uh, metformin and, and uh, the immunohistochemical or uh, luminescence, immune luminescence was increased also. So here's two different ways of looking at what, how metformin affects some pathways in uh, pancreatic cells. Uh, if we didn't have that much luck with metformin in mammary cancer, we tried, of course, it in many organs. When the clinicians were interested in many organs, and they needed a drug to try, and it was a safe one. But this is a ER positive cancer in a uh, experimental MNU induced rat mammary cancer. Uh, the controls uh, come down here like this, and metformin looked like it was actually making this animals die a little sooner. We were concerned about that, and they were looking at multiplicity of tumors, and that seemed to be slightly elevated. It's not statistically significant, but we were concerned that it wasn't really showing a positive, strong effect like we saw in the pancreas. So we've kind of given up on that one. This, and this. And then we looked at ER negative cancers in the mammary. This is MMTV, new 53 knockout model of mouse mammary. It's ER negative cancers. And again, we didn't see much effect, maybe a little negative effect with metformin in terms of uh, percent, per percent survival or average number of mammary cancers. So this is uh, some work by Henry Thompson. Um, so we've kind of left that alone uh, for, <laughs> for mammary cancer. It may not be the right, right organ to test metformin in, but it may have promise in other organs. Uh, this was a, uh, a mouse model of both lung and colon tumors. Uh, this is a Saha, a uh, HDAC inhibitor. And torvastatin, the statin that most, a lot of people take a torvastatin. Uh, and so we, we're looking at mouse lung and colon tumors. I'll show you some data here. Uh, so as far as uh, lung tumors, uh, torvastatin by itself gave you a slight decrease. I don't believe that was significant. Saha gave you a significant decrease in lung tumors. These are uh, vinyl carbonate induced lung tumors, I believe. And the combination of the two gave a almost complete suppression of lung tumors. So it was a good combination. So those two mechanisms may be good. Uh, the colon tumors, are, these are DMH-induced uh, colon tumors, dimethylhydrazine-induced colon tumors. And we saw a similar pattern, although we didn't see much synergy or additivity with the combination in the colon, but much above Saha alone. So those are two good, I think, mechanisms for lung and colon. We looked at our pancreatic model again. Uh, the statins uh, seemed to work quite well. Uh, they, we had looked at a number of mechanisms. I'll show you a slide on the mechanisms of uh, statins. 
Uh, it might be applicable to pancreatic cancer. They're very non-toxic. People take them for a long period of time. And this is a, uh, a mouse model that uh, produces a lot of pancreatic cancer. Uh, here's the data. Uh, this is pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. The, uh, the control animals, they get about half the animals have pancreatic cancer, ductal pancreatic cancer. And there are two different uh, doses of atorvastatin in the diet, and these are close to around what people take, two or 400 parts per million in the diet. Uh, and we saw a tremendous suppression of pancreatic cancer in these mice. And so why are we seeing this? Uh, Torvastatin can block inflammation in the ERK pathway, um, blocks COX-2 and beta-catenin, and out acts on the surface with P2X7, a receptor that's important in CAV1, and uh, P21 is elevated. So there's a lot of mechanisms that a torvastatin can hit that uh, will block cancer, including, you know, increasing apoptosis and decreasing proliferation for some of these. Here's the biochemical data. AKT1 was blocked. P2X7 was decreased. Cyclin D1 decreased. P21 increased. COX2 decreased. Beta-catenin decreased a little bit. So it looks like atorvastatin has a lot of mechanisms which relate to cancer that could be beneficial and helpful. So I think uh, you can keep that in mind as a combination for uh, pancreatic cancers. There are a lot of precancerous lesions in the pancreas that I wasn't really a student of pancreatic cancer until four, five, six years ago. And I learned when we got all these clinicians in from different places around the country, yeah, there are people out there with pre-malignant conditions of the pancreas, and they're at very high risk. Uh, this is a point I wanted to make uh, about... Uh, NSAIDs, uh, I think they're very potent in cancer prevention. Uh, they work across the board uh, in colon, all different kinds of NSAIDs, COX-1, COX-2 inhibitors, uh, uh, skin cancer. They work across five organs. And uh, bladder cancer also seems susceptible to NSAIDs, very wise, and esophageal cancer, head and neck. They uh, seem to work in the animals, uh, at both, uh, and the pancreas now. We've started working on that. Lycophilone's a, a dual inhibitor, Cox-Lox inhibitor, and Celecoxib works in the pancreas. So here's a uh, PET imaging, uh, which made the cover of one of the cancer journals. I forget which oncology or something. But this is a control animal, non non um, uh, mutant animal, you don't see anything. But this is your uh, animal with a KRAS mutant in gene, and you see a lot of uh, uh, lighting up in the pancreas in in the midsection of the animal. And uh, if you give them aspirin, and this happened to be uh, NO-linked aspirin, we went through a series of tests with nit nitric oxide links and says, thinking they might be less toxic and they might work better, I think uh, that didn't pan out very well. Uh, I don't think there's any advantage to that, uh, but we did do a lot of studies, so we've tried aspirin in this model. I don't have a, the image for that, but it, it, works, it works about the same. I'll show you here. This was uh, pancreatic adenocarcinoma incidence. Again, 80%. These are probably males. Uh, and two different doses of aspirin. Uh, which is not outside the possibility of what people might take during the day, three or four aspirin tablets, five maybe. Uh, but we got a, a significant reduction in pancreatic cancer. So we told the clinicians with their patients that have precancerous lesions, have your patients take aspirin. It's not going to kill them <laughs> unless they have a stomach problem. Uh, and, or keep records of if they do take NSAIDs. And, and their outcomes, you know, take, make some records of these people. We have to start at this, we have to start somewhere. Uh, inactivity is not a good strategy. Uh, this study that uh, in bladder cancer in a OHBBN uh, nitrosamine model of bladder cancer in fish or rats, and the first part of this table, hope it's big enough for everybody to see, 
uh, we had N-naproxen or straight naproxen in the diet. And uh, we look here at uh, uh, urinary bladder uh, weights and uh, controls was, uh, which had no, that had no uh, NSAIDs. This is with the carcinogens, so their bladders kind of got big with cancer. And bladder cancer is hard to count because they all grow together. It's one big gamish. And so we used the weights, and we were we did try and, and uh, uh, look at cancers, very large ones, and we we could see with naproxen, you know, 70, 60, 70, 80 percent almost uh, reduction in large cancers, and uh, even the weights showed the same thing. So this was given uh, at the end of the carcinogen treatment through the end of the experiment, and the last group of animals here. The, we started the agents three weeks after we stopped carcinogen. So at, at that time, these animals had lesions, small lesions in the bladder, small cancers in the bladder already. So we started late. So we saw an attenuated effect, 50% uh, reduction in the weights. And dip, and, but we saw for the larger lesions, we went from like half the animals having large lesions, almost one or two animals. So this was starting late. So this was actually better than giving it continuously. So that was a very surprising result, and I think naproxen is, is an excellent drug. Uh, this is colon, switching gears. This is azoxymethane-induced multicryptosi in colon. Fisher rats again. And if you look in the control animals, uh, you get 35 or so multicryptosi. These are large. Uh, Abrolytic staining uh, crypts in the colon. This is a, a marker for early marker for colon cancer. You give naproxen, you can cut that in half or two thirds. At normal doses, people would take, and the NO linked naproxen, uh, kind of not 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 as good as straight naproxen. Although these are equimolar, because you got the NO group hanging on there, so it was effective, but it didn't show any advantage in colon cancer. So this is another point I wanted to make. Uh, I already made a point about uh, NSAIDs. They work across uh, many different NSAIDs work in uh, colon. Also, ODC inhibitors work quite well. We've done it in clinically. The combination of ODC inhibitors and NSAIDs uh, was very effective in the, in the colon in humans. Glucocorticoids, rexinoids, PI3 and kinase, and MEK inhibitors in the lung. So the lung has a specific set of mechanisms that seem to work there. Uh, we haven't explored all the mechanisms, of course, but these are the ones. And breast antiestrogens and aromatase inhibitors, as clinical trials have shown, EGFR inhibitors also look very potent in the animal models. Uh, these have some side effects when people take them. So we're trying to work around that by intermittent dosing, and I'll show you some slides later about that. The bladder, NSAIDs work in the bladder. ODC inhibitors, same things that you probably see in the colon. And, of course, uh, breast uh, Retinoids, or prostate, excuse me, dihydrotestosterone inhibitors and retinoids seem to work well in uh, prostate cancers. Most of this is uh, preclinical data. And the skin, skin looks like uh, colon and bladder. It responds to the same kinds of mechanisms for some reason. And so epithelial tissues. Oral cancers, NSAIDs and antioxidants. Uh, we've done a lot of work here. Pancreas series, NSAIDs again show up. RAS and EGFR inhibitors show up, and the esophagus, LOX and COX inhibitors show up as, as inhibiting uh, esophageal cancer in, in many different models. So each organ seems to respond to a, maybe a different set, sometimes a common set of mechanisms. We, of course, this, uh, people will say this is a limited set of organs. You know, what have you done with brain cancer lately? <laughs> and the answer is nothing. Uh, there's no good animal models for brain cancer. I wish somebody had a good animal model for brain cancer or even in some of the blood cancers, leukemias, lymphomas, there needs to be a good animal model. We haven't started anything in those areas. and Not too many people have. So uh, this is a retinoid uh, out of the University of Alabama. We looked at some synthetic retinoids. This is, uh, we looked at a whole variety of these. The one we picked out to follow is called 9-cis UAB30. This is a... A retinoid that kind of looks like 
It's just retinoic acid, but has a nine position. Uh, and it looked very potent in mammary cancer. And you put uh, different groups on different places, and you lost the activity. And the nice thing about uh, this particular agent is it didn't increase glucoc uh, didn't increase um, triglycerides. The problem with a lot of RXR inhibiting retinoids is your triglycerides go through the roof, and then you got to take something else to keep those down. So here's the clinical. This is the animal data. This is the MNU rat mammary study, and they get four or five cancers per animal in the controls. If you put the methyl group in the four position, uh, you get moderate, moderate activity, but it's not great. And this is the UAB30. You can inhibit, you know, get one cancer per animal down here instead of four or five in the controls. And I think uh, this was now in the clinic for breast cancer. Uh, it's a relatively new drug. It can be taken orally. It's well tolerated. Phase one trials went well. Uh, so we're hoping that one can get through. Uh, we had uh, a drug company interested in this and talked to them for two years, MERS. <laughs> we couldn't convince them to uh, partner with us to develop this agent. It was very expensive to make, and uh, you know they didn't see an immediate payback. But they, I think, are going to continue to develop for skin cancer. They had some skin applications for it. So I think they're going to continue to make it. And we Carney ended up saying, well, can we buy, if you're making kilos of this, can we buy some for our clinical trials against breast cancer? And, uh, I think that's still viable. I hope that they will uh, work with us on that. I'm not real sure. So uh, the last second group of agents I want to talk about is immunoprevention, which is biological agents. And I think this makes a lot of sense. I'll discuss that later. Uh, as you know, as cancer grows from pre-cancer uh, through cancer, uh, the immune system first is very competent, then it decreases, and once you get to full-blown cancers, the immunosuppressive system is pretty non-functional. And you know, there are a lot of people working on trying to bring this back uh, with TD1 inhibitors and various other strategies. But I think treating pre-cancer is going to be much easier. You have an intact immune system to work with. Uh, there's a lot of different mechanisms involved, and so it, it makes sense that to attack cancer early uh, when you have a good functional immune system. And so why would we pursue this? There's a lot of advantages to vaccines. You get better compliance, for one thing. People forget to take their pills, or pills make them sick, or give them headaches or something. But you go in for one or two vaccinations, and you're done. Luckily, we have immune memories, and so hopefully we won't have to keep immunizing people. Uh, it has a long-term protection. People could be vaccinated as kids, youth, and maintain this protection through life. Uh, it's less expensive, too. These vaccines are these new, new ways of developing and making vaccines. It's very cheap, and so you can do these vaccines uh, for pennies. And this is good for third world countries, too, because third world countries can't afford some of these drugs we're talking about. Um, and there's also less toxicity. We haven't really had a problem in uh, safety trials with the vaccines uh, outside of a little reaction at the injection site like you usually get with your flu shot. Uh, they're very safe. Uh, we've been developing both protein vaccines and DNA vaccines. Uh, the FDA is learning how to regulate these vaccines. They're kind of okay with the protein vaccines and mixtures of proteins, but they're kind of hesitant with the DNA vaccines. They're not too sure they want to give some foreign DNA in your body that's impossible to get rid of. Uh, so we're trying to educate them that it's probably okay, uh, but we let them regulate. Okay, so there's been a lot of work of course, uh, in targeting infectious agents, there's a lot of vaccines out there, especially for HPV. Very big success for our uh, division, Gardasil, Severex. These will work with drug companies uh, producing these. This is based on the L1 capsid protein of HPV. There's an L2 protein also of HPV, and we're working on that one uh, in our, our development. Uh, it's ready for the clinic. High 
high success in animals, very low toxicity. And this one is uh, effective against almost all kinds of HPV, all the different 50 different types of HPV, not just the common ones. Gardasil, nine, we have nine different antigens. That, that covers about half or more of the uh, possible uh, varieties of HPV. Uh, there's also an antigens against HBV uh, being worked on. Uh, and there's an E6, E protein, E6, E7 protein at HPV that we've been working on with uh, Dr. Roden, uh, Hopkins. And this has possibilities of being uh, treatment oriented. So you can treat HPV with this one. Uh, these are just, you have to give them before the infection. But this one might be useful for actually treating. And so the new emphasis uh, is in using uh, pieces of proteins, antigens, either in singly with the Nuvax vaccine, that's in the clinic. This was one we developed, HER2 new, IGF binding protein 2, IGF 1 receptor, uh, called WACVAC. This is in clinical trials now. This is a combination of three different uh, antigens uh, mixed up, injected. Works great in ER negative animals. Uh, works a little bit in ER positive animals, and I think if they modulate, maybe add one more protein here, they'll have the ER positive cancer. Uh, working on a telomerase uh, antigen uh, vaccine uh, called INO400. This is in clinical trials. PSA vaccine, Prosvac, this has uh, been around. MUC1 vaccine, this is now in trials. Uh, this is Oliveira Finn's vaccine with the leucine pro protein 1. That's very effective against colon cancer. And in the um, in model of mouse cancer, you can add a little bit of silicoxib to this and eliminate uh, uh, polyps in min mice, intestinal polyps in min mice, which is phenomenal. Never seen that before. The GFR vaccine, a lot of work in this area, especially with lung cancer. Uh, ways to modify this. Um, it seems if you make the protein antigens longer or shorter, it has a big effect on how they work. And there's uh, actually there's a computer program now that you can punch in the uh, amino acid sequence of your antigen and it'll tell you, is this going to be responsive in humans or not? It's very powerful. You don't have to test these in animals, every one of them. There's a KRAS vaccine in development. And there's, uh, this is the current, about the current status. Uh, this is some work that was done before in animals, various transgenic animal models. And the, the important column here is the last one. We see complete protection, complete protection, complete, right down the line. It really protects against uh, cancers and a lot of, these are mammary models, these salivary gland mammary models, multiple adenomatous colon polyps. Uh, these are sarcomas and leukemia. So this strategy uh, has worked quite well in different gem models. I think it's uh, gonna work. Uh, ongoing in the PREVENT program now, we have a multivalent breast cancer vaccine still being developed, uh, new approaches to that colon, multivalent colon vaccine. For lung cancer, the telomerase and multivalent KRAS vaccines in lung cancer. There's an alpha enolase vaccine in MUC1 for pancreatic. It's in preclinical testing now. Uh, this uh, HPR1, RG1 virus-like particle, this is for cervical cancer, this, this is the one I talked about, virus-like particles um, that are going to protect it with almost all kinds of HPV. There's a mesothelian vaccine for ovarian cancer being worked on, and some polyvalent vaccines against fusion proteins. We're going to see fusion proteins in solid tumors, so we're not sure that will work preclinically, but it's worth a shot. Okay, I'm coming to the end of this, but... This is important. If we understood and predict which cancerous cells would turn into cancer, we could develop targeted intervention to prevent cancer from, form from forming. Uh, it, was Do it was Don Coffey that told me one time, he says, if we can tell the lions from the pussycats, we'll have this <laughs> conquered. But we can't tell right now which lesions are going to go on and which aren't. How can we do that? He was devoted to that. So. I think the NCI, and I hope with a lot of prodding on my part, I was trying to push this forward when we were talking about the moonshot. What should we do with the moonshot money? I said, well, like the TCGA, we've got to have a precancer atlas. We've got to develop an atlas 
of molecular and DNA changes and RNA changes that happen preclinically because there's where we're going to find new targets. This is the point. Uh, we need to know what normal cells look like, and these have some mutations anyway, but when it gets this first initiation and dysplastic and carcinoma inside it, right here is where we need to figure out where are the mutations, what pathways are involved, because it's much simpler here in terms of the DNA adducts, DNA protein, or DNA um, problems, uh, loss of heterozygosity and other things, than waiting out here to cancer where you have a multitude of DNA lesions. And it's hard to tell which of these are drivers and which are passengers out here. But we need to go back when, when fewer pathways and fewer uh, damage, less damage is done and find out what these targets are. And so uh, I think the, the benefits of pre-cancer cancer is atlas. And of course, you have to sell this to people to get the funding <laughs> and have to sell this to the committees on the main shot. You know, healthy people are at risk because of various risk factors. And I showed you on my second slide all the risk factors. Uh, we have to define the biological characteristics of what happens when you get that mutation. Detect early diseases. Early detection is key in terms of cancer prevention. There's a whole group of people in a division looking at early detection. Uh, we have to ad adapt some new technology. I think with the new technology, you, you can do uh, DNA sequencing on milligrams and micrograms maybe of tissue. So, because the problem with precancerous lesions is not a big chunk of tumor to, to look at. You have a very microscopic piece you can get by biopsying. And so I think there's that technology has advanced to the point where we can do it. Uh, a lot of imaging can be done. And of course, our goal is early development, early uh, interventions. Because I think we have to intervene early. And there's decades where we can intervene, but it has to be early. So lastly, just uh, what are good strategies to reduce toxicity? As I said before, agent combinations I think are key. I don't think people should be treated with a single agent. <laughs> That's my philosophy. because. Cancer is too complex. Uh, intermittent dosing, I think we've shown that. Reduced toxicity and alternate routes of exposure. These three are, I think, key strategies to reduce toxicity. This is the network of uh, cancer signaling process. You know this one by heart probably. I don't. But uh, you can't just block one pathway here. It ain't going to work. Uh, you have to block multiple pathways. It's very complicated. And just looking at uh, colon cancer, uh, five lipoxygenase and COX-2 increase as you go from normal tissue to cancer tissue. Uh, uh, INOS goes up and uh, RXR alpha goes down, P53 goes down as you uh, get into the uh, adenocarcinoma from normal tissue. So if you block a, a, a good strategy, we can block here or here with a COX-2 inhibitor plus one of these agonists, RxR alpha, 5P53 modulator, 5 LOX or an HMGR inhibitor. Uh, back in, in the precancerous stages, so you might stand the best chance. If you're trying to block uh, things that are way out here, like INOS inhibitors have never worked well for chemo prevention. That's because they only show up late. You can't, you can't work with them down here. Uh, so this is one strategy to develop. What's the best combinations to work with? Uh, single agents, as I said, will block heterogeneous cancer. Oops. The multiple might work. Lower doses, if you can use a combination, you mostly cut the dose in half or more and still get the same effect. Uh, you get lower uh, adverse effects with lower doses. And as I showed you in my mattress slide, you got multiple clones of developing along a pathway to cancer at different rates, different pathways, all that going on at once. And we have a proven clinical trial with an NSAID and an ornithine decarboxylase inhibitor here that prevented the, most all of the serious colon polyps in a human trial. Uh, here's a combination with the pancreatic carcinomas. I just draw your attention to the bottom in males and females. The uh, lycophilum and gefitinib, this is an EGFR inhibitor, it eliminated cancers in the males and the females that typically get 60 to 80 percent cancers. Uh, that's a good combination. And this is an AKT inhibitor in Vorazol. This line here is the one where we gave the combination, inhibited mammary cancer in an MMU-treated mammary cancer model. 
by themselves. They, they did a little bit, but when you add the combination at much lower doses, they inhibited as, as well as some of our best agents. And this is, uh, this is intermittent dosing. This is uh, two EGFR inhibitors, lapatinib and Arisa. Uh, lapatinib is a dual HER2 new EGFR inhibitor, also called Ticurb. Arisa or Gifitin is an EGFR inhibitor. But we can give, if we give them daily, we can suppress can mammary cancer incidence quite nicely. Given weekly, also does a very good job. I don't know if these are statistically significant, but it, it weekly doses at five times the dose works just as well as daily dosing. And uh, here's bladder cancer. Naproxen, given one week off, one week on, three weeks off, three weeks on, works just as well as continuously. These are the controls that rats seem to develop that. Okay. Uh, this is colon cancer. This is complicated, but this is continuous and intermittent dosing of colon cancer. Uh, you get a little attenuation with intermittent dosing, but not much. And if you increase the doses uh, for three weeks on, three weeks off, you're, you're almost back to 80% inhibition of advanced adenocarcinomas in the colon. This is an animal model. Uh, aspirin and meprazole is a great combination in colon. You can give them continuous or intermittent. Seems to work quite well. Three weeks on, three weeks off work just as well as continuous combinations. And here's the future of lung cancer, I believe. I think aerosol delivery is the way to go for lung cancer. I, when I first joined the MCI a long time ago, uh, we, we had tested dozens of agents against lung cancer, and none of them worked very well. It was very discouraging. And so we said, well, we have to deliver them topically by aerosol. And that's what Lee Wattenberg and I got together and said, well, we've got to develop, de deliver these things topically. And so, uh, of course, he did most of the primary work on this with budesonide and, and uh, several other agents, myonositol, and uh, saw great promise of developing the lung agents topically. And I think there's uh, room to do this in other organ organ organisms. Uh, this was a recent study I'll, I'll highlight, uh, rapamycin. We delivered this by aerosol. We got good uh, response, rapamycin alone. Uh, tumor multiplicity was around 20%. Nice dose response with greater doses of inhaled rapamycin. This is uh, percent of mice with greater than 10 tumors. Knock them num numbers way down. This is uh, PS6, phosphorylated S6 protein. This is a marker for mTOR uh, activity in, in the mice. Uh, rapamycin modulates mTOR activity, and we can see a nice dose response. P53 phosphorylated S6 protein went down. Aerosolized bexerotene, uh, which is an RXR inhibitor. That worked well. Uh, this is Ming Yu's study and Zhang, Kui Zhang. Uh, but the nice thing that we learned here is that the tumor multiplicity went way down with bexerotene delivered aerosol, and the tumor load went way down. But the triglyceride level stayed down at the control values, where if you give it in the diet, the triglyceride levels go up around 200, sometimes 300 in these animals. It happens in people, too, if you give them uh, RxR. And this has limited the development of RxR inhibitors in the clinic. Um, this cholesterol goes up, too, so that keep, keeps everything at normal levels. Uh, plasma, and then take, take it orally. High, high levels in the plasma, given by aerosol, low levels in the plasma. Or if you look at lung tissue, high levels in the lung, low levels given in diet. So I think giving lung agents has to go by aerosol. So here's a take-home message in the last minute or two. Uh, new strategies, and I'm, I'm, I have a lot of faith in this precancer atlas program. I think can, uh, with some targeted agents and combinations, uh, we can prevent these cancers from starting and evolving and hopefully uh, make some rational uh, judgment and selections of agents uh, based on, I think, our budget is probably going to be limited. <laughs> the, uh, uh, and I think vaccines, new immune prevention vaccines, I think this is the way to go. Uh, if, if I had money to invest, I would, I would develop a vaccine. Very promising. Vaccines are cheap. Uh, 
preclinical, and a couple have moved into clinical trials. Uh, some work in the clinical, some work well, like the HPV vaccines, but there's some that are, are looking good in the clinic also. And I think we have to look to lower toxicity of agents. If we're going to probably still develop agents. We have to look at the toxicity. How lower that? Because you've got to take these for long periods of time, and every drug has an adverse event. And I like to tell people, especially medical audiences, we need to get into the 21st century in our practice of medicine. Back in the 20th century, we looked at descriptive medicine, but we have to understand the mechanism in the 21st century. How, why is this illness happening? Back in the 20th century, empirical diagnosis, and now we're going to mechanism-based diagnosis in this century. We group a lot of things by organ size, a lot of diseases. But now we're going to de develop uh, ways to look at molecular signatures. Say, for example, breast cancer now has five different molecular signatures. And back before, it was all lumped into breast cancer, <laughs> either positive or negative or something. But now that you can look at this, and this happens in a lot of different, a lot of different uh, arenas. Uh, one size fit all back then, back in the last century. You treat with one drug for one disease. I think you're going to have to get in personalized medicine in the 21st century because. Um, I know that uh, sounds like it's going to cost a lot, but there are ways of, of doing this cheaply. Uh, we're going to do prospective diagnosis in this, this century. Where in the last, we looked at retrospective. You know, how long have you had this problem? Uh, in the 21st century, we're going to prevent disease instead of treating it. That's my. And so here's a list of people who really did the work that I showed you all the data, people from all over the country uh, and here, and uh, my staff. I think uh, they deserve a lot of credit for this. And so I always have to plug our new agent development uh, prevent cancer program. Here's the uh, website down here, but if you just Google prevent cancer program, you'll probably find it. Um, and here's where I spend a lot of my retirement time on CNO Canal, my bicycle, <laughs> and uh, lovely place uh, to reduce your stress. Uh, which is a risk factor, by the way. Okay, I'll take any questions now. I want to remind, um, <laughs> thank you. I want to remind Duluth and Hormel and 450 MCRV that they can ask questions. If they'll signal Nick, we'll take them. But we'll start here in this room. Any questions, comments? Handle a microphone there. If you don't use a microphone, they can't hear you at the remote site. Very gr great talk and with promising results. My question, could you comment on how tumor heterogeneity in human and preclinical models and how that affects chemo preventive therapies? Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity in cancers. And I think uh, preclinically, there's much, much less heterogeneity. And I think that's one advantage to we have decades to treat people. Um, fewer pathways are involved. Uh, so I think that's, that has to be looked at. But I think once. Once you get to a cancer, uh, uh, Don Coffey used to show a picture of a tree. At the trunk of the tree, is, things are pretty simple. But once you get out in the branches and the massive divisions, you have a very complicated disease. And, and trying to cut off one of those branches isn't going to help much. Okay. Other comments or questions? That for, for lung cancer, there's any space for um, new PD-1 inhibitors, or do you like the idea of a vaccine that might do some of the same things for immunity as a, as a much better alternative? Uh, the PD-1 inhibitors have associated toxicity, which can um, make them risky to use in healthy people. Uh, that goes f uh, for other uh, immune, block immune blocking agents. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's room for developing vaccines other than those. <laughs> and uh, I would encourage people to look at, uh, um, think outside the box. Uh, we just funded a trial with microRNA inhaled, microRNA, to try and correct some of the microRNA problems that the lung people develop when they get lung cancer. Uh, I think that uh, is a good route for one. Try that out. <laughs> but I think lung cancer, since it is so prevalent in this country, and uh, especially in other countries around the world where the rates are going through the roof, I think it's uh, uh, we need to think about new ways to fix this problem, to prevent it. You can't convince everybody to stop smoking, what do you think about that? 
We've tried. We had a group upstairs that <coughs> behavioral epidemiologists and people have tried every way to get people to quit. <laughs> but we've kind of reached about, what, 18% or 17% in this country, and it's kind of steadied out the last decade. And our country's going down, but China, Korea, Japan, <laughs> they're having problems. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. I guess that, uh, I mean, with immunoprevention, yes, the potential is there. But I have a question regarding the chemical agent. So selective toxicity is something that uh, I want your, what is your take on that, that these chemopreventive agents, do they have, like, has any, uh, do you have any strategy or any thoughts on selective toxicity that these agents uh, would only target the cancer cells and not the healthy cells? Well, um, some of these targets are uh, properties of rapidly growing cells, like increased ODC, uh, some of your, but uh, it's, a, it's a problem. Uh, uh, you have to, especially in healthy people, you know, we give drugs to healthy people, basically, and so you're really worried about uh, any kind of adverse events. Uh, even the DFMO caused a little bit of hearing loss, and this, this caused people to quit taking it. Uh, you know, Solendax is a great drug, but it's a little toxic to your GI tract. Uh, I think uh, ans other NSAIDs are better, but uh, you're going to get select. This, uh, that's why I think this pre-TCGAs, where we can target me specific mechanisms early, are going to help target those early initiated precancerous cells and not hurt the normal tissue. Good question. Any others? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.